Praise the Lord. We give the Lord thanks. It is good to be in the house of the Lord another time as we continue our celebration, our commemoration of Black History Month. Last week we set the foundation, set the foundation for our Black History celebration. And we start out by saying Black History started from the Bible. Uh, the, 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 the textbook, the Bible is the history book of black people and we go back in the book of Genesis and we pick up where uh, we started last week and we lay out the foundation. And I just want to, you know, as we continue this week, I want to let you know that this year, 2019, it's the 400th anniversary of the arrival of the first Africans that was kidnapped, chained, marked with a branded iron to show ownership or women raped and they were sold into bondage in North America in 1619 at Jamestown. So, you know, we want to stand and we want to give a moment of silence yeah. to all of our ancestors, yeah. all of those people who were kidnapped from their homes, mm -hmm. those who were, they, they, I guess they even raped some poor women before they brought them over. They chained them up, put them into the holes of ship. Some of them was thrown overboard. Yeah. They landed in the new world. They aisled out their skin, put grease on their skin for them to look shiny, sold them, and then they burned them with an iron to put ownership on them. And they went into slavery. And they were there for almost 400 years. We want to stand and we want to have a moment of silence for all of our. Uh, ancestors who experienced that. Let us stand. Praise the Lord. Glory to God. All right. Praise the Lord. Amen. Glory to God. Amen. Bless the Lord. Today we are going to start out by dealing with the transatlantic slave trade. Transatlantic slave trade. We are going to deal with this. And as I said last week, we are dealing with black history and we are calling this series that we are handling black history with a cutting edge because some of the things that we are going to say it might disturb some people some of the things that we are going to talk about it will be things that you never heard before and it might sound so out of order but it is all a part of our history and we are not to be ashamed of the history of black people because our history is a rich history and as I said last week, our history did not start when uh, the Europeans take our forefathers, our ancestors from Africa and, you know, chain us up, put us into the belly of the ships, bring us over here and sold us into slavery. That is not where our history started. Our history started from the Bible. Right. So we have a lot to be proud of. So when we talk about the transatlantic slave trade, and before I go forward, I want to let you know, what I'm, what I'm doing here, I am giving, uh, I have some historical notes here that I'm, you know, dealing with. And as I read these historical notes, anybody have a question? Uh, is there something that you don't understand that I might say? You know, I'll, I'm, I'll go over it and try to clear it up. And if you have a question, you are free to do so at any time. So let us start off by dealing with the transatlantic slave trade. And somebody might ask the question, what is that? The transatlantic slave trade, uh, it's a segment of the global trade, slave trade, uh, that transported 12 million enslaved Africans across the Atlantic Ocean to the Americas from the 16th to the 19th century. It was the second of three uh, stage of so-called triangular trade in which arms, Textile and wine were shipped from Europe to Africa, slaves from Africa to the Americas, and sugar and coffee from the America to Europe. So what the Europeans were doing, the transatlantic slave trade, what they were doing, they were taking um, textile, they were taking guns and ammunition from Europe, and they were going to Africa. And what they do, they pick up their shipload of slaves, and then they bring it back to America, and from America 
they take things like uh, coffee and uh, sugar. They will load up those empty ships. When they empty out the slaves from the ship, they load up the ship with uh, sugar and uh, coffee because the slave that they brought to America is the same slave that producing the sugar and the coffee. So they load it up on these ships and they take these ships to Europe again. So it was, it was the biggest money in the, uh, industry exists in that time. Amen. And this is what uh, was happening. And uh, you know, around 12 million black people were kidnapped and put in chain and shipped from Africa to the Americas. More than 12 million people. These people were kidnapped. They were in their homes. And sometimes when the, these European people talk about, you know, slavery and what they did to us, they make it sound as if, well, these people in Africa, they were just wandering over there and they didn't have, they didn't know how to take care of themselves. And they explain it as though, well, uh, our ancestors, they were like children. And they don't have parents. And the Europeans, they go in like the parents to these children and they went in and it's like they showed them a favor by kidnapping them and you know chain them up some of them rape our women before they brought them over here some some of them they raped these women while they were on the journey and they talked like if you know it was a favor that they did to um, our ancestors but our people our ancestors they were living you know in homes they were living with their families, they have their communities, they have their leaders, they have their kings, they have uh, tribal leaders. These people were very, very simple in their community. And uh, you know, when Europeans go in, they totally distort their lives. And you know, it was um, this week I was watching a documentary on television and they were, they were showing a documentary about the Aborigines people in Australia. And these people were living there for uh, centuries. Living in Australia for centuries. And these are black people also. Living in Australia for centuries. And uh, when uh, the British, the British was kicked out of the United States, what we call the United States today. Back there they had, the British had 13 colonies that they were controlling in that part, and uh, the, colony, the, the, the colonies rebelled against the British because the British was carrying on a war in Canada against the French. Right. Uh, uh, the British was fighting against the French for a long period of time to take over control of Canada. And what happened after the, the, the British won the war against the French, they were more or less on the verge of bankruptcy. So what they did, they decided that they were going to tax their 13 colonies that they have in the United States. And the colonies decided that they are not going to pay no taxes, they rebel. So what the British did, they sent in soldiers over there, and the soldiers went around looking for arms and ammunition. And what happened is that people resist them, people rebel against them. And because these people who were over there in the colonies, it was British people. That it was white people that went over there from England. So they want to tax them now, and they decided they're not going to pay no taxes. So a war broke out over there in the United States, and the United States, uh, Britain fighting against these colonies. And then you have France uh, joining the fight, Spain came in the fight, and it was a big war that was going on over there. So what happened is that uh, eventually those 13 colonies, they rebelled. And they kick out the British and they establish what we have today as the United States of America. So now the British, they are kicked out from those uh, 13 colonies that they were controlling. And what they were doing before that, they used to take all their criminals and send all, all their criminals over into those uh, 13 colonies. So now they don't have no way to send the British criminals. So what the British decide to do, they are going to colonize Australia. And the Aboriginal people lived in Australia for hundreds of years. So they decided they were going to colonize Australia and they were going to send all of their criminals over there in Australia. They went over there and they made these people live in their lives. What they did, they start uprooting them and they put them on reservation. Just like how they put in 
Uh, the native Indians in Canada here, put them on reservation. Europeans came in, meet them here, put them on reservation. They go into um, uh, America, meet the um, uh, native Indians over there, they put them in reservation. They went over in Australia and do the same thing. Put these people, uproot them because these people have a lot of uh, uh, reserves that they have and they have a lot of different uh, things in Australia uh, that these Europeans want. So when they find them in a community where they uh, have uh, different stuff that they want to get into, they want to do mining, they will uproot them and put them to live other places. And then what the um, British did, they'll go in and meet these people living there for centuries. They take away the, the, the title deed of the land. They make the land uh, crown land. So these people don't own the land. <laughs> it's amazing when you uh, look through history and see the way how uh, people of color, black people, was treated by European. And sometimes, you know, people don't want us to talk about these things and they say, well, this thing happened uh, a couple hundred years ago and you, should, you shouldn't really say anything about it. But we need to talk about these things because every other nation of people talk about whatever injustice that was done to them over the years. So what is happening here, the um, Transatlantic Slave Trail trade, uh -uh, it happens and it said around 12 million black people kidnapped, put in chain and shipped from Africa to America, to the Americas, of whom 1.8 million died on the voyage. That voyage is called the Middle Passage. And during that time that they transported Africans from Africa to America, the Middle Passage, it was a dangerous place. And a lot of people, a lot of our ancestors died on, you know, the Middle Passage because reading uh, some of these uh, records, you will see that because uh, it was a long journey and these sharks and all of these uh, sea creatures that eat, you know, human beings and looking for food, they will follow the, the ships as the ship take off from Africa. These uh, animals, these uh, big whales and sharks in the sea, they know that people on board and these people, eventually they will start throwing off some people or some people will jump overboard. Because when they capture these people, when they kidnap these people, a lot of them, they wasn't willing. You know, they want to go back home. So they tell themselves, you know, when they're out there, some part they could just throw themselves overboard and try to swim back. And what the European will do, they will shoot them. Shoot them and, you know, in the water there, then the, the sharks and all of those uh, sea creatures will come and take them and, and, and feast on them. So a lot of these people, all of that uh, 12 million, and the 12 million that they're talking about is very conservative. Some people even believe that it, it may be 100 and, 112 million people that was taken out of, out of Africa. But uh, conservatively, it, they say 12 million. But from that 12 million, 1.8 million people died on the voyage. That's a lot of people. Died on the voyage coming over um, on the Middle Passage. And millions more died within Africa in slave raiding. So why they are raiding? Because they go over there and they're raiding villages. They, what they did, they hired those um, Arab, black Arab people, Muslim people, to go into um, communities where Hebrew Israelite people are living. And what they're doing, they're raiding those areas because the people that was brought over here in chains, it's not just Africans, they're Hebrews. Hebrew Israelite people who went down into Africa in uh, when the, um, we had the destruction of the temple in 70 AD, you know, when Titus, the Roman general, came in and destroyed the temple and, you know, killed so many people. Um, Hebrew Israelite people, they travel from Israel and they go down to um, Africa. If you read the Bible, you will see any time um, Abraham and any of those uh, patriarchs, people in the Bible have any kind of a difficulty that they experience in the first thing that they will do. They're going down to Egypt. They're heading down to into Africa. 
He was our Lord and Savior, uh, Jesus Christ, uh, Yeshua the Messiah. When he was born, when uh, Herod was, he was killing babies, looking to kill the Messiah. What did God say to Joseph and Mary? Go down to Egypt. Went down to Egypt. So Egypt is where uh, these people went. And as they go down into Egypt, the Muslim people who was the black Muslim people and the black Arab people down there wanted to convert them into their religion. And these um, Hebrew Israelite people didn't want to be converted. So when these uh, European people go into Africa and looking for slaves, uh, what these um, Arab and black Muslim people start doing, they start selling those people. So those people that came over here during the, the transatlantic slave trade, they're not just African, they're Hebrew Israelite people. So as I was saying, more than 1.8 million people died during that voyage by you know, coming over here, uh, traveling through the Middle Passage, and millions more died within Africa in slavery, in the raiding these communities, and forced movement to courses or awaiting shipment. They will take them from their village, bring them close by to where the ship docked, and they will put them into um, different pens, pen them up like animals, because they're waiting until they get enough people to, to put on one ship. So these people waiting there, they're dragging them from their villages as they drag them. Maybe children will be left behind. You know, mothers taken away from their children and bring them in these places, have them waiting there for a long period of time. And while they're waiting, people will die also, waiting before they end up going out of the ship. In total, the, 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 the Atlantic trade may have caused the enslavement or death of 20 million people. And this is just a conservative figure, 20 million people. And the Arab and internal African trade, perhaps a similar number. So what they say is that what came out from Africa probably is about 20 million, but also what the Arabs was doing, selling um, black uh, Hebrew Israelite people to different parts of the world, also might amount to another 20 million people. As I said, if you have any questions, um, I'm, I'm a little bit excited. You know, what is going on? But if you have a question, just raise your hand or just give me a shout out, just slow down a bit. All right, so the, the, the major transatlantic slave trading nations were the people who were heavily involved in trading, um, uh, this thing is echoing a lot, I know. The people who were heavily involved in trading um, slaves from Africa. Number one, we have the British Empire. The British Empire traded in slaves at every place that they colonized. They will take these African people and they will drop them off in those places and set up, you know, plantations, you know, put uh, their people to colonize those areas and have African people working for them. The Portuguese, Portuguese Empire, Portuguese have places where they colonize and they will pick up slaves in Africa, drop them off in different places, places like Brazil and all these places that the Portuguese colonize. Then we have the French Empire, they go into Africa for cheap labor going into Africa and they're picking up slaves in their ship and they're bringing it and dropping it off to places that they colonize. Also, we have the French Empire doing the same thing, going and getting slaves. Everybody going to Africa and getting slaves. The Dutch Empire, the United States of America, amen, and places like Belgium and Denmark and all these places going to um, Africa and they're picking up uh, people, picking up slaves and bringing slaves over and dropping them off. So um, as we start out here with the, the transatlantic um, slave trade, one of the things that we have to talk about firstly is that the European people, they use the Bible to justify slavery. The European people use the Bible to justify slavery. And the scripture that they use is Genesis chapter 9 and verse 24 to 27. And it said, And Noah awoke from his wine and knew what his young son had done unto him. 
25, and he said, Curse be Canaan, his servant of servant, shall he be unto his brethren. And he said, Blessed be the Lord God of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servant. God shall enlarge Japheth, and he shall dwell in the tent of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servant. So what is happening here, the European people, what they say, they have a mandate from the Most High God to enslave black people. And what they're doing, they're using the Bible, they're using the Bible as their foundation. And what they're doing here, they're using the text that tells us about um, Noah, when Noah came out from the ark, and you remember Noah planted the vineyard, and then Noah, he drank the wine, he was drunken, and he was in his tent, and apparently he was naked, and uh, his uh, son, Ham, went in and saw Noah's nakedness, and I guess, I don't know if he made fun of his father or whatever he did, but then his other two sons, Shem and Japheth, they went in and they took a towel and they covered up the nakedness of their father Noah. So when Noah recovered himself and he found out what was done, what happened to him, he did not put a curse on Ham, his son. What did he put a, a curse on his grandson, Canaan? So what this uh, these European people are saying, using the Bible, they are saying that the curse that God or Noah put on Canaan is that the black race, they're supposed to be slaves to white people. So well, when the time comes for them to do this wicked deed to um, African people, they arm themselves with the Bible. And not only that Old Testament text that they use, but they also use the text from the New Testament. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 5 to 8. Servant or slaves, be obedient to them that are your master according to the flesh with fear and trembling in singleness of your heart as unto God, unto Christ, not with eye service as men pleasing, but as the servant of Christ doing the will of God from the heart with good will doing service as to the Lord, not to men, knowing that whosoever, whatsoever good thing any man doeth, the same shall receive of the Lord, whether he be uh, born or free. So what they did, they took these two scriptures, one from the Old Testament and one from the New Testament, and they used this as the foundation to enslave black people. And also, another scripture that they also use is a scripture that deal with Cain. Remember when Cain killed uh, Abel, and uh, the Lord placed uh, punishment on Cain, and there was a mark that was put on Cain. And this man, what they said, the mark that was put on Cain is that God turned Cain's uh, skin to black. So the European people said that black skin is a curse. Amen. And not only that, but even when you talk about the Mormon church, the Mormon church for years used that scripture to keep black people from all of their organization. Well, you know, you know, yeah, what black people do in there. You know, black people love everybody, and uh, the, the only people that we don't support is ourselves. And uh, the moment people use that scripture of, of Cain, saying that the, the, the black skin is a curse from God, so therefore, black people who wanted to become members of the Mormon church and want to become go into the priesthood or they have a special place in their temple where people will go in and you know worship they didn't allow black people to go in there and they didn't allow them to become members of the priesthood because they said that the black skin is a curse amen so all of these european people they're using the bible as their foundation to um you know uh, uh, make racist statement and also to enslave black people, they're using the Bible as a foundation. European slave owners believed black people was not humans. They did not see black people as humans. They went over in Africa with the Bible in their hand and with the idea that the black people, well, they're not humans. They see them as animals, they see them as property. 
They did not see them as a human person. And when you look at the some of the wickedness that was done to people who was enslaved by Europeans, and the kind of wickedness that they done to these people, and uh, they didn't consider them as humans, but I think it was on the other, other hand, it was thrown around, it was Europeans. When you look at the wickedness that they done to black people, you have to ask yourself the question, if these European people were really humans? And we are going to get into some of these, uh, some of these uh, things that they done to um, our uh, uh, ancestors uh, during the transatlantic uh, slave trade. So they didn't believe that um, black people are humans. They see them as property, and they have the Bible in their hand, and they have within their mind that these people are not humans. And another thing that they had, they had the white Jesus. They go down to Africa, and they have the Bible in one hand, and they have in their mind that black people, they are not humans. They are just like animals. You know, they don't really have feelings like humans. And then they took with them white Jesus. Last week I was up here and I was trying to explain and I see people don't miss sleeping. This is not time for us to sleep. Amen? This is time for us to peel our eyes and listen. If you don't know your history, you're not going to know where you come from. You're not going to know where you're going. This is not no time to sleep, okay? And feel comfortable, all right? So, as I was saying, these European people never see our ancestors as human beings. They see them as animals or property, and they arm themselves with the Bible, and they arm themselves with the idea in their mind that these people are not humans, and also they arm themselves with the white Jesus. Listen, if you have in your house any picture with this white man that they call Jesus, you need to get rid of it. The person, the person that they paint, the person that they paint as this white Jesus is from a family, an Italian family, who um, the father was uh, Pope Alexander VI. Pope Alexander VI, he was the most wicked uh, Pope you can ever think about. This man, he, he had a special poison that he used to mix and he will secretly give it to anybody that oppose, oppose him. And he will kill them. Uh, they even accuse him of being in an incestuous relationship with his daughter. This man had um, six um, children, illegitimate children. Because back in that time, you know, even now, popes or Catholic priests, they wasn't allowed to have wives. But he was so powerful that he would go around and he had kids, he had six. Six of them. So one of his son, um, who was Sergere uh, uh, Borje, I think if I'm pronouncing it right, he was a very powerful man. He was a military leader. He was a politician, and apparently he was a very handsome person. And you know, before all of this, he had his brother, and according to what they say, he killed his brother, the guy who they have pain as Jesus. I'm talking about. The white man, the white Jesus that we see in all over. People having him hang up in their house, praying him and have hanging up in their house. This guy killed his brother and also his sister's husband. He killed his sister's husband. And uh, this is the same guy uh, that Michael and Jello take him because I guess apparently he was a womanizer, he probably was a bisexual, homosexual, all of these things he was involved in. And Michelangelo, because these guys were powerful and they were rich, Michelangelo take him and they paint him as Jesus Christ. So the person that you might have hung, hung up in your house, the white Jesus that you have hung up in your house, he is not Jesus. No. The historical Jesus, the person who was walking here and all was not a white man. Listen, by the way, if Jesus was white, we as black people, we won't have any problem worshipping him. I don't have a problem worshipping Jesus and bowing down to Jesus if Jesus really uh, was a white man when he walked the earth. But, you know, Jesus was not white. Jesus was not a European person. And when European people paint Jesus as white, what they, the message that they are sending to us is that Jesus is white, God is white, 
And if Jesus is white, God is white, it means that white people, they are superior over black people and over people of color. And this is not anything that we can stand for, we can't stand for that. Right. So we can't support a white Jesus. Amen. The Jesus that we are worshiping is not a white Jesus. We are serving a Hebrew Israelite man that walked this earth, yeah. who when he was a kid, Yahweh the Most High God told his parents to go down in Egypt and hide. Mm -hmm. Amen. And going down in Egypt and hide, it means that he was hiding out amongst black people. That's right. Amen. That's so how can a white person go and hide, you know, among um, a, 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 a nation of people that is black? It doesn't really fit. So what we are saying is that these European people arm themselves with the Bible and they arm themselves with the idea that our ancestors, they were not humans and also they have the white Jesus. Amen. And you know black people, we like um, the things of God. You know, you start talking about God and, you know, even in Canada here, you go out on the street and you start talking about God. If nobody going to come around and stand around and listen, some person of color is going to stand around and listen to what you say. We like to hear about the things of God. So that is how they, 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 they were able to, to entice us and to pull us in, you know, using those kind of a, um, things from the Bible and using the idea that we are not humans and with their white Jesus. Also, they use, at that time, the European people, they have lust for gold. They were crazy for gold. They were greedy for gold. And when the Portuguese first sailed down the Atlantic coast of Africa in the 1430s, they were interested in one thing. Surprisingly, given modern uh, perspective, in it was not slave, but gold. They were interested in gold. Yeah. Even when Christopher Columbus say he sailed down and he came down to the Caribbean, say he discovered St. Vincent and Grenada and Trinidad and Tobago and all of these places and discovered the um, United States. Christopher Columbus did not discover anything. Christopher Columbus, what do you think he was looking for? I have, I have the book on him. Christopher Columbus going all over these little islands and he keep asking these people about gold. He, he just want to find out where gold is. You see somebody have a piece of gold in their nose or in their ears. He investigated and he wanted to know where that gold come from. All he was looking for is gold. It's the same thing uh, with men like Henry Morgan. Remember the book of the end? Yeah. Book of the end, Henry Morgan. He's a pirate. Yeah. Henry Morgan, he went down in the Caribbean set up shop in Jamaica. I think he even bought two estates in Jamaica. He going around in the Caribbean area, in the sea area, and he um, hijacking ships, you know, stealing gold from people because these um, European people, they're all over the world, you know, colonizing, and they dropping off slaves, picking up gold, taking up any kind of a valuable thing that they can take to go back to Europe. They keep doing it. So they have a lust for gold. And how they probably uh, get this idea, these European people, how they probably get this idea that Africa has so much gold is ever since Mansa Musa. Anybody ever hear about Mansa Musa? Mansa Musa, the king of Mali, made his pilgrimage to Mecca in 1325 with 500 servants and 100 camels, each carrying gold. Amen. The region had become associated with such wealth. So Mansa Musa, he was the king of Mali, and this man, Mansa Musa, he was very rich, and not only that, Mansa Musa was very generous. So he was on a trip to Mecca, and he took more than 500 servants, 100 camels loaded down with gold. And every way he passed, because you know, he's traveling through those areas, his you know, black communities going around black people, and every community he goes to, he drop off some gold, give gold to people. He go to Egypt and he share out so much gold that the price of gold go down and it didn't come back up until for another 10 years. 
So when these um, European uh, people see this African king with so much gold and the way he was living, they got the idea that um, Africa have a lot of gold. Because, you know, when you think about um, resources, when you think about resources, um, there's not a whole lot of resources in, comp in comparison to um, the kind of resources that we have in Africa. Europe don't have a lot of resources. Sure. What Europe have, <laughs> the kind of resource that Europe have, they have natural gas, they have coal, they have petroleum, they have metal uh, such as bauxite yeah. to make aluminum, aluminum and copper and iron, ore, all of that they have. But when you, when you take uh, into consideration the kind of uh, resources that they have in Africa, Africa has a large quantity of natural resources, including diamonds, sugar, salt, gold, uh, platinum, iron, uranium, copper, uh, bauxite, silver, petroleum, and cocoa, but also have wood forests and tropical fruits. It is estimated that 30% of the earth mineral resources are founded in the African continent. Right. Having a low human density at the time, because you know Africa is so big and most of these places is not populated. For a long period of time, Africa has been colonized by European countries to exploit African resources. Everybody seems to want to exploit Africa. The Europeans did it for hundreds of years and they continue to do it. And now we have the Chinese going over there doing the same thing. I think the African leaders, they are senseless. Yeah. African leaders are senseless. I see the same thing happening down in the Caribbean. I go down in uh, Grenada and I down there and see um, Chinese people. They're doing all the construction down there, see like. They have these big um, Mack trucks that they're driving around in Grenada, picking up stuff and doing their construction work. And, uh, you know, they control all of the, the construction that is happening down in Grenada and other places. You know, they, can't you think that you can't have, you can't have um, some kind of an engineering company in a Caribbean island, Trinidad, Barbados, St. Vincent, that can train people to do their own work? Instead of you bringing all of these people that taking out everything that you have, you know, all of the resources that you have, they're pulling it out and sending it back to their native land. Amen. So they, they went out there and they had the um, lust for gold and they wanted gold. The transatlantic slave trade began around the mid 15th century when Portuguese, Portuguese, interest in Africa moved away from the feeble deposit of gold to a much more readily available commodity, slave, commodity. Yeah. Commodity is what you trade, you buy and you sell. So what they said is that the Portuguese, when they first went to Africa, they went down there looking for gold, but they couldn't find enough gold in a quick space of time. So what they did, they noticed that there was something else that was more valuable. And what was more valuable? It was black people. They, the slaves were more valuable than gold. I was reading somewhere where the Portuguese at one time, the um, storehouses that they used to keep gold in, they shut it down, but they didn't declare all the gold because they didn't have a whole lot. And they're using those storehouses to store slaves. Because at one time, slavery was more uh, profitable than gold itself. Yeah. Amen. So this is what they're telling us here. Beginning in the last decade of the 1400, we see African people kidnapped. Don't leave out that word, they were kidnapped. None of our ancestors didn't come willingly. Amen. They kidnapped the people over there from their families. They had families, they were kidnapped from their families and they crammed into the dark pit of slave ports. Crammed them into the dark pit of slave ports. And they handcuffed them, and then they piled them into the bowels of ships. We see voyages and traders such as John Hawkins. Anybody ever read about John Hawkins? John, they took up, well, they, they anoint him 
and they call him Saul John Hawkins in 1560s, becoming some of the uh, first British men to make massive fortunes from their trade in kidnap African. So this guy, uh, John Hawkins, what he was doing, he was a shipbuilder. And uh, what he was doing, he building ships, and then I guess he going around and he was doing the same kind of job that Henry Morgan was doing. But what the British government did, they anointed him and they make what he was doing legal. They make him an admiral and they add salt to his name. And that is what racism is all about, you know. Racism is not just when white people say that they hate uh, black people or black people say they hate white people. You know, white people say, well, they don't want to mix with black people. That is only the face of racism. And what they did, they fool us. They make us believe that, tell uh, black people that racism is white people saying that they hate black people. And white people say they don't want to go to the same school as black people. And they make us feel, well, these are, are the things that really um, consist racism. That is only the face of racism. Racism is a system of power. Yeah, it's a system of power where government make laws. Yeah. Government make laws to enslave a certain group of people. They make a law that black people have to be enslaved. They make a law that black people are not humans, they are property. They make a law that black people are not supposed to learn to read. Yeah. You know, you reading back in that time, during the time of slavery, and they catch you reading, uh, learning to read, somebody teaching you to read. You know what, the person who teaching that child to read, they're gonna harm them, or they're gonna burn them, or do them some kind of a wickedness, and that child is gonna be in serious trouble. So when we talk about real racism, is when the state start to make laws, and make rules, and saying, like when they, what they have in the United States during the um, Jim, uh, uh, Jim Crow years, you know, they make law and say that black people can't use the same restaurant, the same washroom, black people can't walk on the sidewalks. At the same time, if you walk on the sidewalk and you see a white person coming, you have to step aside. That is the law. <laughs> can't go to the same school as um, white people. That was the law. And that is what racism is all about. Amen. Racism and white supremacy is when these uh, government people make these laws and then these laws is used to enslave people and to make people's life a living hell. Amen. Praise the Lord. All right, they pile them into the bowels of shit. We see voyages and traders such as John Hawking in the uh, 15th and uh, 60s uh, becoming some of the first British men to make massive fortune from this trade in kidnap African. English, he was an English slave trader. This is what this guy John Hawkins was. And he become filthy rich by trading in slaves. You know, all of these multi-millionaire people that we have today, throughout the whole world, these European people, all of them that have their billions upon billions of dollars, they are reaping, even today, they are reaping the harvest of slavery. Right, right. That is what they're reaping. Right. Amen. When, the, when, when you check way back, the economy in Europe was nothing. Right. When you go a history of Europe, this is not to pull anybody down. People in Europe, Europe were starving. Right. People in Europe, they were dying every two, three years. You right. see some sickness will hit Europe. Sure. And millions upon millions of people in Europe dying out, you know, during that time. You know, and as I was trying to explain last week, the European people, they are the last set of people that really come up on the face of the earth. And last week, according to what, you know, the studies I was trying to explain to you, we as people of color, black people, we came here a long time before these people. And one of the studies I was trying to go into last week, and I was asking the question, you know, before the flood, if Europeans did exist, and according to what a lot of um, scientists and a lot of people who um, do um, these studies, they wasn't here. 
there was one here, um, people of color, black people, people with pigment in their bodies, they were here thousands of years before these people come. Amen. Yes, go ahead. But I don't know if I have all the answers, but what I can say is that what happened to black people today, it has to do with us as Hebrew Israel people, we rebel against God. Amen. We, the, the nation of Israel, the true nation of Israel, the true Hebrew Israelite people rebel against God. And because they rebel against God, the curses that is in Deuteronomy chapter 28, and a lot of times when we read Deuteronomy chapter 28, all we concentrate on is the blessing. Where God says, He's going to bless you, you're going out and you're coming in, whatever you put your hands in, shall be blessed. He's going to make you the head and not the tail. And we, you know, start talking about that. But we're not talking about the curses. And because of the fact that um, we didn't obey uh, the Lord, the curses that is found in Deuteronomy chapter 28 is being fulfilled on us. And Yes. But, but um, Pastor, as Christians, yes. you, you, the Lord's work is done in us, but can we really say that we are really enjoying the full blessing that is given to us? No, I don't think so. We, we're not. Yeah, what, so what happened? Uh, when, when you say what happened, what do you mean? Yeah, okay. We have accepted the Lord, the Lord has done His work yes. in us. We are no more rebellious against the Lord. We are in love with Him. Why then? Is the, that blessing is not on us. Well, listen, some of us, some people who receive Yeshua as their Lord and Savior, yeah. they remove themselves from under the curse. But the, 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 the Hebrew Israelite nation, as a race of people, when God looks at us collectively, God still sees us as a rebellious nation. And then the curses of Deuteronomy, it's supposed to come on, it's on the whole nation. It's, it's on the nation of God's people. It's not here no, it's not just, you know, it, 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 uh, once uh, the nation rebel against God, the nation is going to pay the penalty that um, the Lord uh, decreed upon that, that whole nation. So that is the reason why, you know, we are going through all of this suffering. We need to come back to God. That is the thing. We need to come back to God. And until we come back to God, and that's why some people are very excited because this year is 400 years since um, uh, the abolition or uh, the enslavement of God's people. And a lot of people are very excited that something is going to happen. I don't know what is going to happen. But what we are saying is that um, we, we, we need to be alert. We need to be alert to what is going on. Amen. And I know, you know, even as I speak to them, maybe some people say, well, you know, we shouldn't be talking about these things in church. And we don't need to talk about these things. Some people might be saying, well, these things don't have anything to do with the Lord Jesus Christ. You don't have anything to do with the Bible. But I want to say to you today, anything uh, to do with injustices, anything to do with injustice, you don't think if Jesus... If Jesus was here, you know, during the time of slavery, you don't think you would speak against him? Amen. Amen. Look at Stephen. Stephen in the book of Acts. He gave us a 1500 years history on the suffering of his people. Go and read in the book of Acts. It tells you about the history of the suffering of God's people. So if Stephen, the, the man of God was stoned to death, he talked about the suffering of God's people. Why can't we today talk about, you know, um, suffering that our people experience? People today want us to just be silent. Don't say nothing about it. You have the Jewish people talking about the so-called Jewish people. The Ashkenazi Jewish people talking about their suffering that they experienced under Hitler. But we as uh, black people, people of color, 
We're supposed to be silent. Don't say nothing. It happened a long time. And if you talk about these things, you're digging up old wounds and you're making people feel uncomfortable. So, let them feel uncomfortable. Who do it to us? Yeah. Amen. I am not going to feel uncomfortable talking about the history of my ancestors. Transatlantic slave trade. We are talking about that. <laughs> Amen. Praise the Lord. By the late 17th century, we see the British coming to dominate the slave trade. The British dominate the slave trade. You know, Great Britain, they sanctify themselves. Where slavery is concerned, they sanctify themselves and they set themselves in a position as if, well, they wasn't really involved because of the fact that at the end, when the abolition of slavery um, take place, Great Britain, they were one of the leading um, nations that was pushing for slavery abolition. And because they were one of the leading uh, nations pushing for that, and the reason why they were pushing for that, according to Dr. Eric Williams, he was a historian, Prime Minister of Trinidad and Tobago. According to what Dr. Eric Williams said, the only, the only reason why they decided to abolish slavery is because the Europeans, they wasn't making enough money out of it anymore. Right. And they, they saw a different avenue where they can make more money. And uh, the avenue that they were looking at, it was the splitting up of Africa. Because during the time of slavery, they didn't split up Africa yet. It's after the abolition, they decided that they were going to do something else. They're going to go into uh, Africa and they're going to start taking this part and taking this part. So we're going to get into that um, later on anyway. So what they're saying is that the British Empire, they were, um, you know, we, 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 uh, by the late 17th century, we see the British Empire coming to dominate the slave trade. And what I was saying is that Great Britain, they put themselves in a position there as if, well, they were so innocent because of the fact that they were pushing for the abolition of slavery. So because they were pushing for the abolition of slavery, they didn't have any involvement in the slave trade. But Great Britain, they were one of the uh, empires that dominated the slave trade. And they haven't overtaken the Portuguese. The Portuguese, man, I tell you, these people, these Portuguese people, they were wicked to the black Hebrew Israelite people who were living down in, um, you know, uh, Brazil. They used to treat them horrible down in uh, Brazil. Sp uh, Spanish and, and the Dutch, we see tens of thousands of merchant ships making the Middle Passage. This was big business. Thousands of ships going from this part of the world, the New World, and they're going to Africa. They're carrying their ammunition and their rum and they're coming back with slaves and other, you know, things, gold and whatever they find. The voyage across the Atlantic, uh, it transformed captives from Africa into a, a American slave commodities. These people that they brought over here, they became uh, commodities. In other words, they were trading, they were buying them, sell them. You go in Africa, you pick up a, a boatload of slave, you come over, you sell it. Then, you know, these people buy the slaves, they brand them, take them out and they resell them, and then you can resell them and you keep reselling them. They were just like commodities. They didn't consider them as humans. Amen. They were counted as property. Half of all the African transported into slavery during the 18th century were carried in the holes of British ships. It was the British and, and what was happening here, most of these ships that was transporting the Africans from Africa, bringing them over here to the New World, they were owned by the Ashkenazi people. The Jewish Ashkenazi people, they play a big role in slavery also. Most of these ships bringing people from Africa coming over here was owned by the Ashkenazi Jewish people. What they were doing, they were disguising themselves. They were taking on different names. They were taking on names that wasn't Jewish. So people identified who they was. And they were heavily involved. From the 15th to the 19th, 
and century, more than 11 million shackled black captives were forcefully transported to Americas, and uh, our known multitude were lost at sea. As I said before, more than 1.8 million of these people died during um, the, 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 the voyage. Captives were often thrown overboard when they were too sick. If you're too sick, <laughs> you can't make it. A lot of the, 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 these ship owners, because it was such a big business, what they were doing, they were insuring, they insured the slave. So when uh, they put them on the ship, and uh, if they throw themselves overboard, or if they die, or something happened to them, when they reach back to America, or wherever they're going, they have the insurance, and they don't lose anything. The insurance companies will pay them for whatever losses they have. So some of these people, when they're sick, they will get rid of them. Amen. Or too strong will. Maybe somebody like me. <laughs> My wife was telling me, you know, you wouldn't make it in slavery. And it's true. I wasn't going to go along. <laughs> you know, a strong will person, he, he's not going to make it, or she's not going to make it. <laughs> or too numerous to feed. If they have too much people that they can't keep up in feeding them, some of these people, they're going to get rid of them. They throw them overboard because they have them insured. And as I said before, some of these sound like, you know, it's things that is too wicked for any human person to do. But these things really happen. You know, those who survived the journey were dumped on the shores and sold to the highest bidder. They bring them here and they dump them on the shores. They will give them a bath because they want to look good. They will shine down their skin with oil and, you know, they will sell them into slavery. When the slave owner bought them, the first thing he will do, he will take his branding iron and he will put his brand, just like when you brand a horse, put his ownership on these people. Then so again and again and again like financial asset. Just like how you selling stocks and bonds today. This is how these people were sold. Mothers were separated from children. And husbands from wives as persons were torn into property. Didn't have any right. All they see you as is property. So even though you come on the same ship with your wife, they will split you up. Amen. Split you up, take you away from your family, take you away from your, your uh, children, from your husband, from your wife. And you know today you hear the same people who did that, European people, they will boldly say that we as black people, we don't know what family values is all about. And they will throw that in our faces. Who do you think start splitting it up, splitting us up? We didn't start this splitting up. Is these people who start doing that? African people or family people? Right. You know, you come here and you want a plantation. You want an estate with white masters, and because he wants to go with your wife and you resist him, or he wants to go with your daughter, or he wants to go with your son because these guys are so wicked. They will rape um, uh, our women, rape the young girls, rape the young boys. Europeans, they, they, in their ways, they are very nasty in their ways. They will rape the young boys, rape the young girls, and even the men, to show the men that they are boys. They will even rape the men right in front of his family to make him know that he's nothing. So, you know, these things that we are talking about, these are not things that were done in secret. These things were done in, in the open and they are all recorded in history. Amen. All right, let me, let me go on for a little bit again. So, um, slaves were raped and lynched. I tell you, this is black history with a cutting edge. And some people are going to be offended and say, well, Pastor Duncan, you shouldn't be talking about these things. But I'm going to rub it in because it happened and it, it's recorded in history. Slaves were raped and lynched thousands, maybe into millions of our black women were raped. You know, it is recorded that after slavery came to an end, in America alone, they had more than 250,000 mulatto 
people, children that came out from slavery. Why do you think 250,000 miles of children came out from slavery? Why do you think they come? They came out from uh, when the white man raped our women. It's because they raped these women and uh, the mulatto race came into existence from black people that was raped during the time, black women that was raped during the time of slavery. Amen. So, um, slave or rape and lynch. Back in that time, if you just look at a white woman, they will just take that man and they will lynch him. Their bodies were branded, flared. You know what that means? They, they strip off your skin. They didn't think black people were humans. And sometimes they will do things to them just to see if they will feel pain. Strip off their skin. Amen. And mutilate them. You know, they'll cut out their, their private parts. The men cut out their private parts. You know, do it as, as fun. Many slave owners in their diaries, manuals, newspaper writing, and correspondence readily admitted the punishment and violation they executed on black people on the cane field and in the homes. They put it in newspaper. They write it down in their diary. They document every wickedness that they, some of these wickedness that they were doing to our ancestors. Take for for example the unapologetic uh, recollection of violence and killing that comprised the diary of Thomas Thistlewood. You should look that up. Thomas Thistlewood, a British slave owner in Jamaica. In the mid 1700s, Tisselwood recorded 3,852 acts of sexual intercourse with 132 enslaved women. Amen. In his 37 years in Jamaica, this guy said that he had sexual intercourse with 3,852 3, women. Sorry, uh, times. 3,852 times you have sexual relationship with 136 enslaved women that he had in Jamaica. In his 23, um, sorry, in his 23rd July 1956 entry, he described punishing a slave in the following manner. Give him a moderate whipping. Then he said, I pickle him. You know what I mean by pickle him? When no, when he done beat the slave, what he's doing here, he take the cat and nine tail, and the cat and nine tail had that piece of steel on the tip. And when they swing that cat and nine tail over the back of the slave, it ripped into his back and he pulled out pieces of flesh. So what he, what he did, he said that he, um, he, he whipped him, and then he, he pickle him. When he pickled him here, what he's saying, pickle him here is that he take salt and pepper and then uh, he mix it with lime juice. And then he take the salt and the pepper and he already beat the slave. His back caught, you know, so much wounds on his back. And then he will pickle him. Show the salt and the pepper and the lime juice on this man's skin. Today, if you just have a little wound on your, your hand and you put some salt and it, it stings you. Could you imagine you, your back isn't sore. Pieces of flesh come out of your back and this wicked man taking um, salt and pepper and lime juice and throwing on a person. And that's the reason why I ask the question, if these people are really human beings, can a human person do something like that to another human being? These people who are doing this thing, they were not humans. They were not humans. Made, hear what he said, made Hector defecate in his mouth. This is what he did here. After he going to beat him and he pickled him to punish him for that because I guess he was a runaway slave. This guy ran away. And to really punish him, he's going to the limit. He made Hector, Hector's the next slave. This is, this is out there, this is record. He made Hector defecate in um, this guy's mouth. Immediately I put a gag in his mouth while his mouth was full. So he, he, he gagged him. So what he had in his mouth can get out and made him wear it four or five hours. This happened in Jamaica. 
Yes. It hurt. Yes. It hurt in my guts. Mm -hmm. But that's what I'm saying. It's black history with a cutting edge. And some of these things, a lot of people are afraid to talk about it. And uh, I'm not afraid to talk about it because, you see, I, I don't have anything to gain from, from ministry. Um, I am a, a person who takes up the responsibility to proclaim the truth. And uh, the truth is going to set you free. And a lot of people in society today want us not to talk about these things. And want us just to, you know, forget about these things. But these things happen. And uh, it is historical record. And all other nations and people, they have the, 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 the right to talk about all the suffering. Don't you see the, the, the Ashkenazi people, they will put on television all of the different documentary and all of the wickedness that was done to their people. And they have thousands of movies and documentary. Their, what was done to them was documented. What was done to uh, millions of black people, it wasn't documented. Nobody don't make no movie, nobody don't film nothing. You know, so we supposed to just stay silent and we're not supposed to talk about it. What I'm saying here, these are things that was done to our people. And, you know, when most of us was in school, nobody didn't take the time to talk about these things because they think that we wasn't um, intelligent enough to learn anything. So what they start teaching us about is about being caught up over the moon and Ma Mr. Master Willie and Paul C and Mother Hen and all of these kind of foolish things. But listen man, we have people in our community who know how to dig these things up. And those of us who have a little bit of information, we need to pass it on to our people. We can't let it um, stay covered. And I'm not saying these things to anybody to develop any kind of hatred. You know, when you hate somebody, is a waste of energy. But you can't say, well, I don't want to hear these things because it made me feel bad. Listen, it's the truth, and the truth is going to set you free. So what he did, he, he, he get the slave guy to defecate in the, the, guy, the guy's mouth, and he shut it up, and make him wear it, Mr. Tisselwood. He did that to one of our Jamaican brothers during his time in Jamaica. He did that to him, and this is documented in Barbados. The British established one of the first modern slave society. You know what this means? It means that the British in Barbados established a slave society. And everything that happened in Barbados, it was done by slaves. All of the heavy lifting, every kind of a work was done by slaves. It means that you born a slave, you're gonna grow up a slave, you're gonna die a slave. There was no way for you to get out of slavery because you are in a slave society. Everything that happened in Barbados was done by slaves and it was under the control of the British people. The British people, they will take their um, people from Europe and they will drop them off in Barbados, in other Caribbean islands, and then the slave ship will come in and these people will buy slaves, they give them land, they take the land and they set up plantations and they have these people working for nothing for years upon years upon years and there's no uh, deliverance, there's no time for them to get out, they can't get out. In the they are condemned for life. Slavery has certainly been practiced in many parts of the world since ancient time. But never before has a territory, a territory entirely uh, economy become based on slave labor for capital in uh, industry. So what I say is that private people, private people become rich off of what was going on. All of these people off of slavery, they set up their plantation and they become rich off of what was going on. I'm going to come to an end. Uh, beginning in the 1620, in 1627, the enslaved were put to work in the intense cultivation of sugar cane, working in chain gangs in shifts that covered a 24 hour period. They were in chain gangs and they were working in a 24 hour shift period cycle. In one of these great experiments uh, in human terror, 
the world has ever known, this system of plantation slavery expanded over the following century across the Caribbean. We talk about us. Yeah. And some of you sitting down on me as equally, you know, so what? I'm talking about our ancestors, you know, and I'm talking about the wickedness that was done to us. And this was done to people from the Caribbean, Ireland, South America, and the Southern United States. I'm going to close here, but you know what I want to close with? We as black people, we are tough people. Yeah. We are strong people. And it doesn't matter what you do. It doesn't matter what you want punishment. Tissel wood, there's so many tissel wood out there. Yeah. Tissel wood, it doesn't matter what tissel wood, how much punishment tissel wood will do to um, the slave. Tissel wood, he can't kill them. We have to do it. You can't kill us so easy. Enough. Glory, hallelujah, we tough. Praise God. All of the wickedness that was dished out to us throughout history, even in our time, we are still facing difficulty. We are still facing hardship. But listen, man, we are going to stay here until the time comes. Yes, yes. Nobody can take us out. That's right. We are too tough. Uh -huh. And I'm telling you, if, if it was another nation that was doing it to Europeans, Europeans couldn't undergo that kind of a suffering and survive. True. It's only one people, one nation of people who can go through that suffering and survive. It is us, we the Hebrew Israelite people. We are the people of God. And that is the reason why we need to come back to God. And uh, this cycle, this curse, this punishment that is upon black people. We as black people, we as Hebrew Israelite people, we need to come to God. We need to get back on our knees and we need to repent. And we need to turn to God and cry out to Him so that, you know, this curse that is placed upon us by the Most High God can be broken, finally broken and defeated in the name of His Son, Yeshua. May the Lord bless us. Praise the name of the Lord. Amen. I'm going to stay here for today. <laughs> I warn you, I warn you, I warn you, I warn you. I warn you guys and I told you, it's going to be black history with a cutting edge. And I'm telling you, I can see some of you guys over there, you are cut up already. You, I, I, we don't even have no white people here. We don't have no European here. And some of the, our own people are cut. That is what it is. It is black history with a cutting edge. Yeah. Hallelujah. May the Lord bless us.